My name is Mike Finch and I'm here as usual with Professor Ross Tucker and uh, as usual during this time of uh, COVID and CV1 or coronavirus, however you want to call it, we are in different places and we are missing having our coffee before our chats in the morning, but uh, at least we've had a bit of a chat every time we do this podcast. And uh, over the next couple of weeks, uh, Ross and I have had some uh, good chats to all of our patron, uh, Patreon um, supporters. And uh, what we're going to be doing is offering some very special uh, podcast uh, for our Patreon supporters. So you can head, head over to our Patreon page. The details will be in the notes on our podcast and uh, you can uh, get some special stuff around uh, different topics. There'll be slightly shorter podcasts, but really comes some spicy things in there and some really interesting stuff as well. So uh, looking forward to doing that. We, we're a bit more organized than we were probably a month or so ago when all the panic around uh, COVID kind of hit. I was trying to figure out how I was supposed to work at home with a, a working wife and a three-year-old. Uh, Ross was, I think, more busy than he's ever been. I remember you saying me around rugby. And uh, now I kind of think it's a weird thing because if you go into social media now, um, you know, you kind of feel that you're, uh, people aren't talking about COVID every single day. They're just kind of getting on with their lives and uh, people are just trying to find their space. Uh, but uh, Ross, I know that there are some plans around uh, the, the, patron, the patron page. Uh, just give us some insight from your side on how that's going. Yeah, um, thanks very much to those of you who've uh, pledged to us on Patreon. We've got three levels. I sort of said it up tongue in cheek. There was Olympic athletes, Olympic champion and Olympic legend. And we've got 28 of you now spread across those three levels, which is fantastic. I mean, you, you know, I, I can speak for you on this one, Mike, but like we would do this anyway because we love doing it. But the yeah. fact that people pledge to it is uh, all the more meaningful. So we really appreciate that. And what we want to do is once every few weeks, couple of weeks, have a dedicated podcast that you drive the content for. So for instance, we're thinking about doing a Q&A with sports physicians where we allow you as our VIP followers to suggest questions, to ask questions. You've had a niggle, you've had an injury, or you know someone who has, and we will get an expert who will be able to answer those questions for you. So it's, a, it's like a user-driven content podcast, especially for you. Uh, even today, I put out a question yesterday around your thoughts on today's podcast topic, and a couple of you have responded. So we're going to absorb those questions and, and, and try and make Patreon our place for dynamic interaction between you and us so that we can have it as our sort of VIP room. So if that's an incentive for you to go on and pledge, then please do it. Uh, for the rest of you just listening, obviously, it's good to have you. But uh, if you enjoy this pod and the time that Mike and I spend, then your pledges are obviously extremely welcome and it does give us a chance to dedicate a bit more time and justify our time and that's why we're going to be extending some of our podcasting material as a result of, of your pledges so thank you very much to all of those people um some things that have happened this week to me and i'm really quite i wouldn't say ashamed but kind of surprised that it's taking me so long to get onto this train but i finally got myself a smart trainer and for those of you in the cycling world um, everybody will know what those mean. You can either have a Watt bike or all sorts of uh, kickers and uh, taxes. I've got one of those tax flux twos, which I got yesterday. And for the first time since all this lockdown stuff has happened, and we're just kind of in South Africa next week, we're, we're able to exercise at any time of the day. We had a strange situation in this country where we were only allowed to exercise between six and nine in the morning. So it was basically like a race um, a race style, style situation every morning with so many people out on the, on the roads, but at least some sense has prevailed for next week. But, and it's, it's winter here in South Africa, but Ross, I know that you've got a Watt bike and you've also been uh, trying it out a bit. It is absolutely amazing. I've read about it. I've, we've had stories in Bicycling Magazine here in South Africa about it. There's a lot of social media around it, but it really is amazing how it works. I, I was blown away. I rode harder in the half an hour on my smart trainer last night that I've ridden in a very long time. I had a great deal of fun and I can see how it really does enhance the cycling performance. While people, I know in the, in the UK, there was this fear that people would never go and ride outside because everybody was having too good a time riding on Zwift inside. Yeah, I, I thought I was a late adopter. So I'm pleased that the editor of Bicycling <laughs> came, in, came in after me, but I was, getting, I was getting injured and insane doing shuttles up and down the street in front of my house. And so I put out a request and the, and the folks from Wattbike kindly donated me one for the rest of lockdown. And I got onto Zwift straight away. And two things are, one is you can see how someone would overtrain massively on that thing, because like you, you just get sucked into things you didn't intend to do. Like I'll, I'll go on there and ride like an easy route, 
but with a small climb in the middle, and I'll say, it's okay, I'm just going to take it easy today. But then when that, you get to that climb, and I don't know if you've done enough to see this yet, they pop up a little leaderboard on the left-hand side for the king of the mountain. <laughs> and for the next three kilometers, it's like bleeding from the eyes to try and see how high up the leaderboard I can get. And, and it's, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go so far as to say that I would replace outdoor riding with it, but it's, uh, it's unbelievable for like indoor training stuff. It's re it really is. The, the whole feel of it, the variety, the sort of stochastic nature of it, that to me is the big value because yeah. I used to ride the watt bike a lot. But then I'm entirely in control, you know, and, and it, it yeah. makes it quite predictable. But now with a stochastic nature, I think it simulates outdoor cycling much, much more realistically. It's 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 cool. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things is I, I don't think I've ever really taken note of what my wattage is. Uh, I have a son who lives in London and um, I have a, a brother that lives in, in the south in West Sussex in the UK and another brother who lives in Australia. And the dream has always been that because we were all mad cycling people to be able to get together on Zwift and actually have a ride together, which we can do now. And in fact, tonight I have an appointment with my son uh, to ride a, around a course that he's designated um, on Zwift tonight. And uh, I'm quite excited about that. And I, I agree with you. I, I'm, I'm one of those that prefers to be outside if, if I have a choice. But if it's miserable weather and it's cold and the convenience of just getting out of bed, putting on a pair of cycling pants, maybe a t-shirt and then getting on the bike, that's really attractive because getting out on the bike in winter is a real pain with multiple layers and all that sort of thing. So that there is there is a huge advantage, I think, to it, specifically when the weather is crap and whether we've, or whether we're dealing with a pandemic. <laughs> yeah, and you go, it's like this gamification of it. It's, it's you're a character in a computer game. You're earning points, accumulating miles competing against other people i suspect you'll start recognizing people's names you train at similar times and so on as well all i'll say yeah. is when you ride with way just be sure he's dialing it down a notch because then he will he will <laughs> hurt you on swift badly no no he's uh, very competitive i looked at his stats on Zwift the other day one of the interesting things i saw and it was uh, in, i don't know it's a it's a sad fact but apparently now you can ride on swift through the set of grand theft auto um <laughs> So yeah. somebody posted the other day, said, uh, this morning, in one of our cycling groups saying that this is basically like cycling in Cape Town because you have to be aware of somebody stealing your bike. Uh, but, uh, you know, that, that, that's the level of advancement this thing is going, is that they're putting this, this virtual space in cycling in particular into this realm, which is not totally dull. I think, you know, if you were a runner and you were a, you know, any other sport, you would struggle to do this. But cycling does have the unique advantage of being able to make this a workable solution. And, we, and we've seen these. I mean, I, I know we agree on this, that these virtual races that they have on television to make up for the lack of live racing are deadly dull and I can't watch them. But can't the watch it, yeah. Yeah, it's, for the participant, it's actually quite interesting to watch, to be honest. Yeah, it's but, cool. And uh, it's quite exciting to think. Like, I mean, this technology is how old now? A couple of years, right? Yeah. I mean, imagine in two years' time, if you think about it growing exponentially in the level of sophistication and so on it's going to be remarkable the other thing by the way that happens on swift is weight cheating because if you can produce let's say 300 watts you'd far rather do that weighing 65 than 85 kilograms and like you know yeah. there's people on there like loads of them i did a group ride on saturday with virgin active and i'm, I'm telling you there are some people there based on their numbers they should be having professional contracts in europe like, i mean <laughs> there was there was a woman riding six and a half watts a kilogram for about 15 minutes off the front i was like this is ridiculous are you kidding me <laughs> and that's so i don't know whether it's you see that could be calibration of the bike that it's over reading the wattage or all you got to do is knock your your mass down by 20 percent the next thing you're a superstar so i wouldn't <laughs> i wouldn't compare too much between people because i trust them less than i trust elite sport in terms of cheating I guess I, I mean I'm interested to know this. So if you, if you were an average rider on Zwift or Rovi is another one that we talk about trainer trainer row. There's a whole bunch of these uh, online programs. If if you look at somebody on an average guy, if he's doing more than what three watts per kilogram, then he's probably a ringer unless he's a good rider. Yeah, for how say? long? I mean, like, give, give us a uh, time here. 30 minutes, 20, 20 minutes. Yeah, 30 minutes, 30 minutes, yeah. Yeah, so the elites, the elites are doing six, right? Six, six to 6.4 watts a kilogram. And then you, yeah. if, if someone ever passes you with that, then you should recognize his <laughs> name because he's, a, he's, a, he's an alpha male on the road to Zwift. Um, 
then you then you obviously drop down to professional cyclists are so in the range of five to five and a half and then your top level guys four and a half to five but yeah i'd say if you're above three to three and a half watts a kilogram you're, you're decent um yeah it all depends though because I mean, you'll find hundreds of people riding two watts a kilogram and that's that's fine but yeah i think four watts a kilo for 30 minutes or more is is a solid effort yeah Anyway, so I uh, hope that the cyclists are enjoying uh, their, their technology because uh, you certainly have an advantage over a lot of sports out there at the moment. So let's uh, turn our attention to the subject of our podcast today. And uh, the, what we're talking about is something that I think, personally, we're a bit surprised to be talking about right now. Um, when we first did our, our, our first COVID podcast, uh, which was about three or four weeks into the lockdown here in South Africa, we were trying to decide and we talked a little bit about what sports we thought would be the first to come back after the, 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 the lockdown or to come back in this time. And we had all sorts of theories around uh, cycling and all those sort of things. But as we sit here today, we have already had football matches taking place in Germany um, that I know of. Um, I think there is lots of talk about many different events having plans to put events on the map within the next month or so. And we are slightly ahead of what I thought we would be at, given the fact that this virus is nowhere near ending. Ross, are you surprised at the pace of which this has changed? Um, a little bit, yeah. I thought maybe a few weeks or a month or two longer um, before we turn. I, I didn't think that European football would complete their season. And maybe in some places, England, I know, are going to vote today or tomorrow. Uh, Spain starts on the 8th, I think I saw. Germany obviously began a week ago. They had two rounds of matches with, with empty stadiums. So, yeah, it's, it's been maybe a little bit surprising. But then everything about this virus was unpredictable from the start. You know, as a scientist watching it, you know, the, the first group of models came out and they predicted apocalyptic events. And then, sure enough, in some places that happened... In other places, it didn't. So then that was the first question. Then you look at the places where it didn't and how bad it actually got or how not bad it actually got. And then the models were questioned. And there's a real, there's a real murkiness here. I mean, I don't know. Now, now we're in a situation where many countries have released their lockdown elements uh, for the last couple of weeks. Schools are back. Uh, public places are open. I was just looking at photographs of beaches in England that are crowded. And yeah. of course, now people are warning against the second wave. Will that happen? Everyone's on high alert and so on. So it's, a, it's an exceptionally uncertain time. So I would have thought back in March when this all began, that that uncertainty would have pushed the date of return back. So it is a little bit surprising. But then, then you think about it in other ways. And what's become apparent is that young people are much, much, much less likely to suffer severe disease. Uh, the studies have now started to come out to quantify that. It was always known, but now you get these studies. And I mean, I was just looking at another one yesterday where they worked out that if you if you set like a reference point for someone in their 50s, the risk of a 30 to 40 year old dying is, is literally one tenth of that. Whereas when you go up to 70 year olds, you're talking five to 10 times more. So the influence of age on this disease is enormous. The influence of obesity, smoking, uh, diabetes, cancers, all that sort of stuff is also enormous. So when you think about an elite athlete population in their 20s with none of those comorbidities, this is probably the safest group of humans to actually get the virus. And I'm not saying that trivially. Yeah. So when you start thinking about it like that, then you start thinking like professional sport can, can put a bubble around these players like no other industry because you can quarantine them in preparation camps. You can contact trace may be better than most other industries or workplaces and so on. So the combination of those things probably offsets the risk. And I think that it actually then makes sense to try and get sport back before other things, provided you don't stick people in the stands. So let's talk a, a little bit specifically about some of the models that are being looked at uh, around sport. Uh, I, I, let's talk in the soccer space. You've, you've already alluded to the fact that there are, there's no spectators and I think there's some journalists they allow into the stadium and that sort of thing. Um, what, as a sports scientist, are 
the most common themes around models to get sport back into some sort of workable solution until, the, yes. until there's a vaccine. So the name of the game, it's the same, the same fundamental driving principle behind lockdown is how do we minimize exposure to people who have the disease? That's what it's all about. And lockdown was just a tool to achieve that. So when they shut down shops and businesses and they allowed only 10 people in a supermarket at a time, when they effectively locked us in our houses, except for going to the shops and medical, all they were trying to do was minimize contact. And that's, that remains in place now as the main thing. So when you look at the guidelines that have been put forward by German football, I assume the Spanish is the same. Uh, rugby's developed its own. It includes doing what are some pretty severe things to minimize exposure. So for instance, the clubhouses and the facilities have to be cleaned daily. For every 24 hours, there has to be a deep clean of shared facilities. They're encouraging players to keep social distance. So they can't arrive together and hang out in the changing rooms before. They're not allowed to share spaces with people. For the first two weeks after return, they're not allowed to train in groups larger than, say, 10 or 5 or 4, whatever it was. So New Zealand rugby returned for fitness work, and they were only allowed to exist in pairs or individually. So everything's about keeping spacing, spacing, spacing. And then allied to that is testing. In German football, I know they're testing them three times a week. So every player is being tested almost every second day. The, the wow. presumption being that the earlier we catch it, the fewer people you've had a chance to infect before we isolate you. And that, that's the same model that's being applied to society, but it's difficult to apply it to 100,000 people in a city. It's not so yeah. difficult to apply it to 35 people in a sports team. So, so it's, it's the same stuff. There's nothing new here. Um, I know, for instance, one entry point and one exit point to a stadium. Every player arrives and they have their temperature measured at the forehead because that's an early indication of a developing fever. If your temperature is too high, you get sent off for a further evaluation. If it's low enough, you come in, you do the training session. No hanging around afterwards, go home, that sort of thing. So it's, it's, it's pretty militant in its desire to keep people away from other people. Um, and that's basically all there is to it. Allied, as I said, to testing is, is the, the recipe. And I mean, that's kind of what society will be faced with for the next few months too. One of the interesting stories coming out of this is the, 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 the Major League Basket, Baseball um, guys saying that, suggesting that they put all of the 30 teams of Major League Baseball into an area in Phoenix and they have this like super dome of containment um, and they run the MLB as a result and, and keep it everybody tight. But I, I saw some footage the other day talking specifically about how many people that would involve and they were estimating that you know, if you look at all the backup staff, the players, the media, the television crews, all that thing, you're looking at like 10,000 people you have to put in a bubble. And then there's also the emotional aspects of, you know, cutting people off from their families um, for an extended period of time. So this is also, and it's an interesting model that because maybe that could even be scaled down. Maybe it doesn't work for Major League Baseball because it's so massive, but there is some evidence to suggest if you can create this bubble of security in a smaller events that that would be for, an, for a reasonably extended period, that that could be a solution. Yeah, but the integrity of that bubble is the key thing because if you put all those people into what is a relatively small area and something gets into that bubble, now the bubble becomes the weakness. That's actually the problem because, yeah. because you've got a lot of people sharing common spaces and the moment that virus gets in there, those common spaces are choke points and viruses love those choke points. So you could very easily go from a perfectly safe situation to actually one of the highest risk situations in no time at all. So yeah. the, the fundamental thing is, can you defend the integrity of that bubble? And it's not unique to baseball. I saw in Australia, the rugby league initially floated the idea of actually putting the teams on an island so that they were away <laughs> from the mainland and then actually getting them in just to play. And in a sense, that's where New Zealand is now because you know, New Zealand's had seven cases in the last two weeks. It's, it's virtually yeah. eradicated in New Zealand. And because it's an island, they've controlled borders really well. There is very little chance of encountering someone with COVID-19 in New Zealand. So they, they could now resume effectively normal life. They're still being semi-cautious. They've got four levels 
of alert stage and they're in their, their second to lowest one. And by the 13th of June, they'll be playing rugby again. So they are almost an example of like a bubble because of their yeah. geography and their location in the world and Ireland. And yeah, they're, they're good to go until that bubble bursts or there's a tiny hole in that bubble. And then, then the problems begin potentially anew for them. But that was the, I mean, that was the point of lockdown was to, was to give countries these opportunities to stabilize, to get the base rate really low, potentially to eradicate it. And then they can respond to future outbreaks by contact tracing and identifying and isolating those people. So, you know, you know for sport in Germany, uh, they had to do 14 days of quarantine before they were allowed to play. Uh, if you violated that, you were taking off the team roster for a while. 14 days starts again. Because with the progression of COVID-19, we now know that if you are isolated for 14 days and you don't develop the symptoms, in the, then you are clear to go play again. So it's all about managing transmission and exposure to someone who could transmit it to you. And the other thing about it is just on the studies is the study out of Japan showed that the risk of transmission is 19 times higher indoors than out. There have been other studies that have shown that by far, by far, the, 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 num the, the most cases are coming from household, car, and shared transport risk uh, transmission, and then office places. So the high risk exists for indoor closed environments where there is insufficient ventilation, which then by extension makes sport considerably safer. So I think, again, it comes back to this thing is I, I support, I mean, we're biased uh, in saying this, but I support the idea of getting sport back uh, as quickly as possible provided you can mitigate the risks to the community in which that sport happens. And I think it's, I think it'll happen quickly. Now Italy will be next to come along Australia, potentially AFL starts soon rugby league. So yeah, we'll, we'll be back to at least not having to watch reruns, whether the sport will be <laughs> of the same, same quality as it has been in the last few years is another question. I can, I've I can tell you right now, I've been watching uh, the highlights of the Wimbledon Championships from the 1970s right through. So my history of yeah. tennis has improved dramatically in the last you know, a couple of weeks. But yeah, I mean, I, I, one of the questions I, I suppose we, it's, it's, it's hypothetical to some extent, well, not hypothetical, it's, it's logical, that the commercial pressure on professional sport must be absolutely enormous. And we're seeing in cycling that, you know, that it's an area where I'm particularly interested, but some of those professional teams have shut down as a result of this. They don't see them getting the exposure for the year. So mm -hmm. even though this isn't a sports science question, there is, an, a, 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 sadly, the financial pressure of making sure that professional sports gets up and running. So I, get, I guess in a way, you have to make sure that the players are safe, but are they, is the question going to be that they're going to push it too much so that they can get the that they can get the uh, the sport up and running safely, or do you feel like sport generally is taking a very cautious approach and it's not just like let's make sure that we get professional sport back so we can make money, that people are going to be conservative enough to make the right decision, not be swayed by the by money. So you say that it's uh, not a scientific question, and and you're right, it's not. But I think. More broadly speaking, if I start with a global viewpoint before I narrow it down to sport, one of the things that's been missing in the general discourse about this issue and disease and the lockdown and how it's impacting the world is that multidisciplinary viewpoint. Because you see that that same question you've just asked can be applied to manufacturing, to agriculture, to retail, to this, the hospitality industry, which is by far going to be the most severely hit. You think travel, restaurants, services. Um, the question from the beginning is, are, do, does one allow the, the cure, the solution to the disease to cause the second, third, fourth, fifth order consequences, which could persist for many years? And I still have concerns about that. I, I still have economic concerns. I mean, you think about this, this country, you know, South Africa shuts down effectively for six, seven weeks. How many people lose the only income that they had, they don't have fallback, they don't have safety nets and so on. And you see this, then you, then you get the debate, well, oh, you don't care about human life. Meanwhile, the actuaries are telling us that poverty costs human lives just as much as the disease might, and it's just this big unknown. So I'm not, I'm not sitting here telling you which way I think the balance should have gone, but the, the question you've asked is the fundamental question facing all industries, and sport is no different, is 
to what extent do we hurt sport by not playing it as opposed to hurt public health by playing it? And where's that balance? It seems to me that society has applied so much pressure on sport that it cannot get away with being reckless. Um, yeah. The fact that there are no fans, the fact that they've got three tests a week, the fact that they've got all these quarantine things in place. I saw in England, and I think this is ridiculous, that one case and they'll suspend the tournament, uh, the league again. For me, that's extreme. I mean, this thing is going to happen. Um, yeah. so, so the short answer is at the moment, I don't feel they're being reckless, but we don't have evidence because there has not yet been a case of a German footballer diagnosed with COVID-19 shown to infect teammates. Um, yeah. If that evidence emerges and, and that guy playing for Bayern Munich is proven to infect three of his teammates and two of his opponents, then you know that it's probably not worth continuing with. Whereas if that case exists and he infects no one, then you actually have a situation where it is safe. So as has been the case from the beginning, we're making decisions in the absence of any evidence at all. But my feeling is that the, that the process so far for sport has actually been quite good. And in fact, if anything serves as a model for how the hospitality industry might need to come back eventually, services, restaurants, takeaways. And I realize that it's harder to scale up for restaurants, but the concepts that are working or hopefully work in sport should be applied to those other industries. Yeah. But just on uh, that also, yeah. it was kind of inevitable that football was going to be the first one back because that's where the biggest money came. So there's no doubt that there's this tension. Um, you know, how much... You see it, and it gets it gets falsely dichotomized, like into how much is a life worth, and that's not fair. But I think yeah. that if you can get back with as low a risk as possible, without exposing people who have no choice to that risk, then then you must. And that's not just for sport; that's everything. Is it as simple as a, a risk versus reward scenario that there's always going to be risk, but the reward? for getting sport back and all of the support services that go with it and the sponsorships that potentially would be lost if they didn't would be lost. And therefore it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a math game. I mean, it, it's very, as you say, it's very difficult to qu quantify a human life that dies of mm. the coronavirus because of a sporting event, but how many people may die from other reasons because of the lack of any activity in this area. So yes, it is a risk reward thing. The problem is that we can't quantify the risks yeah. and, and quantifying the reward from the intervention is also very difficult. So we have lockdown, we have social distancing, we have uh, limits on public gatherings and so on. How much does that actually help? You know, there are people, uh, we'll call them the, the dissenting voices, who've argued that lockdowns make no difference at all. Uh, I don't agree with that. It seems to me quite clear that when you lock down, you reduce transmission and then your cases drops. But in the long term, 12 to 18 months, or perhaps even more, do those lockdowns have consequences that actually end up being worse than the thing they were intended to treat? That's the yeah. problem. And actuaries can quantify those because, you know, an actuary or even an epidemiologist is interested in years of life lost. And there are pretty well established models for years of life as a consequence of malnutrition and poverty and so on. And based on what's happening to the economy, they can they can start doing that. And, and you can actually work out that by 2022, they will be able to look back and say that this spike in excess debts cost the economy this much. This loss of GDP in different countries cost the economy this much. And this is the relative impact of those. But you don't know that now. So you're asking these decision makers who I feel sympathy for to basically make decisions based on too many unknowns, you know? So that's the problem. For sports, they're looking at and saying, if we can't complete the season and we lose broadcast, right, that's $400 million gone. So <laughs> that's that's in hand and they're freaking out. So obviously you understand why they want to get back back there, but they can't weigh up the other side of it. You know, it's, it's, it's yeah. uh, I'm glad I'm not in a decision-making position. <laughs> Yeah, it's very easy for us to comment, I guess, as fans and wish that we could see it. I mean, I looked at some of the stuff happening on the cycling front and every event seems to be happening around the end of October. So I think in like the 25th of October, there's like four different major cycling events happening at the same time. And, you know, how do, which ones do I record? But I think let's, do, let's talk a little bit about professional sport now. We looked at, we've looked at uh, the various sports coming out of it. They're doing different things. 
there's some other parts of this that are fascinating in that the season has been massively disrupted, whether it's soccer or rugby or cycling or running or whatever, by this thing. I read a story, I think, the other day talking about how they, they I think it was actually on the BBC, saying that they reckon that there's going to be a 25% increase in injuries in soccer players, most definitely because of the players coming back and haven't had the right preparation building into the um, building into the season. Is that a, that's a big number of more injuries based on players not being prepped enough. Is that, yeah. is, it, is that, is the fear as, as big as that? The fear is big. I mean, part of me thinks like 25% would be an acceptable number because it would probably be within the realms of normal variation. There's some evidence that it might even be higher and particularly higher for quite severe injuries, especially when you think about sports that involve a little bit of contact where you actually need more time to prepare. So the, the principle here is, and listeners can go back and listen, we did a podcast, was it the beginning of this year called The Science of Perfect Training? Yes, for our first one of Just, 2020, yeah. Yeah, and we introduced to you like the principles that underpin how we gain fitness and adaptation. And it's not really that different here. So... An elite athlete is accustomed to a certain load, and load is different things to different people. But broadly speaking, it's the volume, it's the speed of what you do, and it's the complexity of the movement. So if we take a footballer, for instance, that player, by the time the season starts, they've had a pre-season, over which time they've gradually increased the load and the speed and the complexity. So they might start, for instance, with simple linear movements after their off-season, or, or after an injury, it's the same thing. Can they walk? Can they jog? Can they do basic agility, side-to-side -side movements? And then as they adapt uh, to that, which involves becoming stronger, more balanced, more flexible, take your pick, they progress to more difficult tasks. And eventually you get full-on sprinting. You get accelerations, decelerations, contact, agility, changing direction. I mean, think about what is involved at a corner kick in football is You've got to sprint into a space, you've got to stop, you've got to jump, you've got to land, you've got to turn, you've got to, and you've got to do all this in a crowd of people. The, the problem is when you take away that gradual progression that can be loaded on the player in preseason and they go into it too quickly, now you get what's called an acute load, which far exceeds the, the chronic adaptation and it breaks. Yeah. The tendon, the muscle tear. So you could get a hamstring tear as a result of the player just not quite getting up to speed with the acceleration, deceleration. And back in, back in 2011, there was a really interesting opportunistic study, which was then published, where in NFL football, the players were locked out as a consequence of a pay dispute. And from about May all the way until July, they could not access their training facilities, their medical staff, their physios, their doctors. I suppose they still could have done personal stuff, but they didn't have access to the formal system so that was 136 days and then they returned for what was a very condensed preseason, in which they had only 17 days of preparation before they started playing preseason matches and what they found was that there were 10 ruptured achilles tendons in the first 12 days that they returned to camp i mean that's astonishingly high <laughs> because their baseline is that they would get between five and eight a whole season so the, the normal expectation is five to eight a year, and all of a sudden they had 10 within 12 days. And the theory goes that you had all these players, and there's so much interesting stuff, you know. It happened to be mostly young players who got these injuries, whereas normally an Achilles tendon happens to an older guy. So they, they showed that the average age normally is 29. This season, it was 24. Average playing experience normally is six years. This year, it was one and a half years. And so it, the, the, the conclusion was that when you take away a player's ability to prepare gradually and then suddenly expose them to that load, the, the risk of injury goes through the roof. And that's the problem now. So in rugby, you know, New Zealand started training a couple of weeks ago. It's another two weeks before they get back into it. Maybe that's not going to be enough. Maybe you're going to see a whole bunch of shoulders because they're not conditioned for contact at the shoulder. Maybe you'll see ACLs and hamstrings and Achilles tendons and so on. It's a big, it's a big concern for sport because the normal way of preparing players has had to change in response to the disease. So certainly interesting thing to keep an eye on. 
I think what maybe mystifies me slightly is that when you think about elite sportsmen and they've spent, you know, soccer players who've spent, you know, probably the better part of their lives training for soccer, they've probably had three or four months off. To understand that the impact of that could have such, such a reasonably catastrophic effect on injuries seems a little bit surprising. I mean, I, I understand rugby to some extent, but those rugby players, whether they've been, you know, whether they've been off for three or four months not having any contact, surely the six, seven, ten years of contact before that would have made a difference in their ability to be able to deal with it. So I'm amazed that the prevalence of injury at that level of sport is so high, um, given yeah. the fact that they're, they're all should be used to it. Yeah, well, I mean, remember the, the base rate is pretty high to begin with, right? So like in rugby, yeah. for instance, there are two and a half to three injuries per match. If we, if we define an injury as a, an event that forces a player to miss training, that happens three times a match. So basically one in 10 players on a rugby field will miss a day as a consequence of that game. Some of them are mild. It's a, it's a bruised thigh. It's a sore foot, whatever it is. You're back in training by Wednesday. Some of them are not mild. You're, you're out for three, six, nine months, right? But, but because the base rate is so high, I suppose a 20% increase has to be put into context. You know, it's, it goes yeah. from three injuries to 3.3 or whatever it is, you know? Yeah. In fact, it'll be a bit more, 3.6 per, per match. But, but the, the, the principle, again, underlying this is, remember, when we did our first Corona podcast, we spoke about detraining because it was inevitable for us as well. I mean, you and me, uh, our, us, the, the Zwift hackers over here, we also lost enormous conditioning as a consequence of falling out of our routine. Oh, now yes. you've got to start thinking about an elite athlete who, when they play those matches, is, is like right, right at the limits of what the human body can do. And if you're not prepared for that, you think about a, an American football wide receiver or basketball or footballer sprinting down the touchline after a ball, having to decelerate from almost top speed to ball control speed within three steps, turning suddenly, maybe being kicked by an opponent. It's the, 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 the lateral demands on ligaments, joints, and, and muscles is so high. The rotational forces that if you fall out of that, it's uh, the, it makes sense actually that the risk is going to be that high. The, the, and maybe yeah. the key thing to take out of it is that the ability to maintain an elite athlete in elite athlete shape is actually incredible. It's it's remarkable. That's why they've got armies of sports scientists and strength and conditioning coaches preparing them and managing them all the time. Yeah, because I guess they're they're always so close to that line of injury versus performance, and this is this is a massive disruptor in that space. I guess that's a good way of explaining it. Exactly, and there's a model, by the way, and it's a I wouldn't call it a hotly contested model because it's a logical model, but it's not yet fully agreed upon. Where your injury risk is predicted by the ratio of workload acutely, so in other words, your recent workload as a as a function of your chronic workload. So what's, what's been found, and there's an Australian guy called Tim Gabbard who's led a lot of this work, is if you track load, so that could be distance run for an athlete or runner, it could be sprinting meters, it could be cycling kilometers, heart rate load, RPEs load, there's different ways that you can, and maybe at some point in the future we should do a podcast on like load management in sport and performance. But yeah. what they've done is they, they find that if you, if you define chronic load as four weeks of load, so over the last month, what have I done? And then you look at what the acute load is, which is over the last week. They reckon that if your acute is more than twice your chronic, then you're at risk of injury. Okay. If it's between, if it's between 0.8 and 1.3, then your risk of injury is lower. So, so what that means is that you can increase load gradually by sort of 10, 20% a week and keep that, that ratio acute to chronic below 1.3 then you'll be actually safer. That doesn't guarantee safe completely, right? But safer. Um, whereas if you, if you go too much. So now the problem is you've got all these players coming back to squad training and they've been told that your first match is on the, I don't know, 17th of June, let's say, for argument's sake. Now they've got to go from, not zero, but almost zero. Let's, let's say a load of 100 to match ready loads, which is 400 within three weeks it's impossible for them to stay below that threshold of acute to chronic. That, that makes sense, right? Yeah. So you, if you congest it, then you force 
too much application of too much load too quickly. And that's the problem. So it's an unavoidable situation, I guess, for them. Um, but that's, yeah. you know, and that's why some, some coaches have said they want eight weeks to get back. And it's like, they're saying, we, we can't give you eight weeks. We want to play for the, for the money. <laughs> So, is it? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm looking at. I'm getting my crystal ball here. Hang on a second. It's actually not a crystal ball. It's my. It's my air purifier. It's I brought it from my daughter. But uh, for those of you watching the video, be able to see it. But I'm calling it my crystal ball here. Is it? And is it not potentially the opportunity for professional sport to look at bigger squads for not only now but for something down the line so there's always been a talk about but particularly in a rugby space where there's just too much rugby you know if we think about here in south africa there's the super rugby there's test matches there's all those and there's a lot of discussion around the fact that rugby suffers from this fact that the top players are playing way too much mm. and therefore maybe there's a gap for those team sports soccer rugby all the, all the team sports to say this is the opportunity to make squads bigger and to make replacements on the field more often um, so that you can you can rotate players better, you can keep them fresher, and everybody potentially has to share le less of the, the more of the pool of money. But there's a longevity to around the sport could be. Is that is that a a thought? Yeah, yeah, it's it's a thought, and I mean that's a conversation that I guarantee you is going on in multiple places around the world for multiple sports because. What COVID-19 is, is, a, is an evolutionary event. It's a pressure. You know, if you think if Charles Darwin was on this call, he would say that this is an evolutionary pressure which will change the way that people operate and that the fittest will survive. And what emerges from it might be something new. I think it was Winston Churchill said, never let a good crisis go to waste. <laughs> it's, the same, it's the same kind of thinking, is that this actually represents an opportunity. And certainly in rugby, there's been talk about in New Zealand and Australia, using this to actually break out of what they were in and create something new. That will then have implications for us. It'll have massive implications for the community game, uh, rugby and other sports. And we'll come to that because Graham, one of our patrons actually asked that question. So we'll, let's park that for now. The, the, the counter pressure to what you're saying there is that the money might reduce. So how do you get bigger squads with less money? So there's, there's, in an ideal world, you would have bigger squads, but in the real world, you might actually have to have smaller squads, which then moves the pressure somewhere else down the line. You know, there's always these, it's so fascinating. There's these second, third, fourth order consequences. I think that what it really is, is an opportunity to look at the calendar. And like, so for instance, World Rugby elected a new chairman, well, the same chairman, but for a new term recently. And he's already said there that we are gonna explore uh, a change in the calendar and try and use this as an opportunity. And I saw last week the Southern Hemisphere countries were talking about how they can move towards that. So it, it will happen. Um, and I think, you know, again, it's, we can't say now, but in a year, two years time from this, we will be able to say that COVID-19 was the watershed that changed the way that professional sport looks. I mean, other, to other than talking about the fact that they might have to look at squad sizes, I mean, Potentially, there's rule changes. I mean, whether those are just rule changes that can happen now, but uh, uh, do you think there are other sports that would benefit from uh, using this opportunity to create different rules to safeguard players? Not necessarily rules of the game, but rules around the sport, maybe. Um, you know, like in rugby, there have been some stories recently about rule changes around the scrum and so on. I think generally most sports will not have an appetite to change the game in a temporary way. They would rather just ride it out and then play the way they used to play. But the structure of it might actually have to change in some way. And I'm not sure exactly how that looks uh, moving forward. I mean, the, for me, the big, the big leverage will come from potentially the calendar. Um, it's an opportunity to try and, because effectively you've had no sport for, what are we talking about, three, four months? Yeah, uh, and if seasons are abandoned, many many will be, some won't be. Um, it's an opportunity to actually like have a reset, which which they've never been able to escape because you're kind of in a trench, and you're just going along the way on on these almost railway lines. So yeah, it'll be interesting. Um, you know, mass yeah. what, what happens? Is, for instance, one thing is mass participation events. Uh, London Marathon was supposed to have been last month. 
Yeah. Uh, New York, that's the same actually as the cycling. They put all those marathons in the fall now. So you're going to, I think London and New York might happen on the same day. Yeah, so. But are our government's going to allow 30,000 people to fill the streets and breathe heavily into the atmosphere in a congested space. I can't see it happening, to be honest. So there we might, we might have elite races where those yeah. elite athletes are quarantined for seven days before they're tested four times in a week. And if they're cleared, they race, but no spectators, no mass participants, which is a great shame. And then community sports. And, and this was the question Graham Smith asked. Um, he says it, it remains to be seen what happened with amateur sport, which will remain locked down for quite a while. This can't be sustainable since pro sport relies on amateurs to feed its players. How do you see this playing out? I, I don't know. I mean, it's easy for sport, pro sport, to ensure clean change rooms, contact tracing, temperature checks. It's much more difficult when you're playing in the, the third team of Dorking Rugby Club to get that stuff done. So do you disappear? It would be a great shame if it happens. Well, it might have to disappear in the short term, but I guess in the long term, those sports will have to. I mean, one you know, at worst case scenario, maybe we're, we're a year away from completely opening up, or I guess there's the conjecture about how long the vaccine will take. I mean, it's it's very difficult to say, but yeah, you know, I think I think I mean I'm, I'm on the same page as you in that I think sport has an amazing role to play in society for showing what's possible to make things happen. As you talked just really uh, just a few moments ago about how these protocols that have been used in sport can be used in the entertainment industry. And I, I've worked a couple, for, a, for a couple of weeks um, on a local race here in Cape Town um, looking around their strategy, launching a virtual race um, and the, on the concept of their virtual race, uh, the, Cape, the Cape Town Marathon. And they were talking about how the fact that you can run the Cape Town Marathon, not necessarily on the route, but through an app. So once you get to 10 kilometers, it shows you where you would be on the map um, the problem with it is, is I don't think people are going to engage on a, on a mass level with virtual racing. But no, I think there's an opportunity potentially to have small fields. Maybe there's a field where everybody gets set off in groups of 10 over mm. a two hour period. You know, very much what happens in cycling events in the UK at the moment. We have these sort of window periods of, of starts. So you all go out in little groups, but you have between six and eight in the morning to start and you don't have big groups of people together and you're still able to race. And, and maybe that will even happen with running events to some extent. And you think about cycling, you know, you could have a, a time trial, which isn't great to watch, but I, I'm always fascinated to, and I look every day and I have a Google alert for looking for sporting Corona because there's, I guarantee that we will, in the next couple of months, somebody will come up with a really clever, smart idea to make this smart uh, and, and to make things happen um, ahead of what we thought. As, as, like the vaccine story, everybody thought there's no way this is going to, a vaccine is going to be available for two years. Now they're talking a year. Things accelerate when necessity calls for it. Yeah. And I mean, we said right at the outset that the world has never learned as much about one narrow thing as it has about this disease in the last uh, three months. It's been extraordinary to, to watch. And a lot of it's junk. Like, let's be honest, like even the, even the models that have been used to predict, they're looking increasingly wonky <laughs> now. Um, but it's the rate of learning and the rate of application of new ideas has been amazing. It's, it's, it's evolution on the scale of something never seen before compressed into three months. It's quite amazing. So I, I agree. I think we'll get there. And what you've described there is probably an intermediate uh, solution is to have very small groups, very selective doing their thing. You know, park runs might return. But instead of everyone going off at eight o'clock, you might book a slot and you might join yeah. the 7.30 run and the 7.45. And they'll just have to make sure that you don't get mixing and that sort of stuff. But there's a yeah. way, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. It might not be yeah. the way we want, but there will be ways to make this happen. And it will be interesting to see exactly how it goes. If I was, by the way, a sport, my biggest concern would be that if I lose people for six months or a season, they don't come back. So that club rugby player who, who used to play three or four matches a year because he's a working pro with a family and that's all he could do, he might say, you know what, I can actually do without this. He might, he might interpret his COVID-induced absence to actually be manageable. And then he doesn't come back in 2021. So I think that the sport should probably invest as much energy and effort into thinking about what's over the horizon rather than at the horizon. You know, like as in, what do yeah. I do after we come back? 
to actually get more people because there might well be a receptive market, you know, starved of the, of the social and the exercise and the sporting stimulation. People might actually go back to sport more than before, but someone's got to yeah. be ready to receive them. So I would, I would be, look hard at how do I receive the people who are keen. The other thing about well, it is, you, and you know, like from running and cycling, people don't do the, the cycle tour and they don't play club cricket and rugby or whatever and run in the club because they want to run. They do it because of the people. And so, so the, social, yeah. the social stimulus that sport gives them is by far the most valuable and they'll come back for that. So, so someone's got to get ready for that wave. What's uh, interesting, and this is a discussion that we have with a lot of our advertisers and people within the industry in cycling and running here in, in Cape Town and South Africa for that matter, is um, what impact this has on the growth of sports like running and cycling. So because in South Africa, the gyms are not going to be open for quite some time, we know that local shoe stores in South Africa are really doing well. They're, they're, they're selling a lot of running shoes. The local two local bike shops that I visited in the last uh, couple in the last week have said they've literally sold out of bikes on the shop floor because people are buying bikes. So people are going outside. They, they, that's the only alternative they have. They're discovering a sport they may not have done before, um, and potentially you're establishing a new market in sports that are more easily accessible, uh, which maybe in the long term means that you know we have a greater source of talent coming through in cycling and running in the next two or three years. You know, it's a bit of a, a bit of a Malcolm Gladwell scenario, but I, I guess, you know, what, what potential does the sports growth have in sports that are accessible around the world? I mean, I know in New York, you can't buy a bicycle in New York because they literally can't bring them in. There's so many that have been sold because they've seen as, as an alternative to public transport. Um, and that's happening globally. So in a way it's quite exciting for endurance sports because yeah. it could rock a boom. Well, I, th I think it's fantastic. I didn't know all those stats. So it's cool that you brought them up. So at the beginning, we spoke about like second, third, fourth order consequences. And normally we think of them as bad. This is an example of good ones. You know, you might get a 20% increase in the number of people who commute to work. They only do it two or three times a week because their company has realized that actually we can work from home and save money on office space and whatnot. So maybe they get a little bit more time for exercise, they get a little bit more time for family. Sport yeah. is then a beneficiary of this two or three steps removed from it. The, the biggest challenge there, just picking up on the sports we've discussed there, running and cycling, is that nobody really owns them. So, so there's a real chance that it's like, it's like if you leave a bucket of water outside, you don't put a lid on it, it's gone in two days. And so what's the equivalent here is you've got all these people filling that bucket up and if no one's there to put a lid on that bucket and actually preserve it, then it could disappear as quickly as it arrived. So someone, someone's got to capitalize on this. And if there is an army of 1,000, 15, 16-year-olds who are now going running with their folks once a week instead of going to the gym or the shopping mall or whatever, how do we turn 10 of those into committed athletes? Who's going to do yeah. that? That's, that's the challenge for countries and for clubs or whatever it is, is how do you how do you harvest the growth? You know, it's almost like if, if you own a farm, what, what COVID-19 is doing is it's dumping like the world's biggest batch of seeds on your land. You still got to go out there and work the land. And that's, that's maybe the big challenge moving forward, but a cool opportunity, oh, no doubt. Yeah, absolutely. So let's uh, look at some of the lighter side of this uh, comeback from sport. And uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you, Ross, we, uh, when we talk about these spectatorless stadiums, I don't know whether it's possible to quantify this, but I'll be fascinated. Two things. First of all, in sport, home ground advantage, will it matter? I don't know whether it matters that much in soccer half the time because normally half the spectators are from the opposing team anyway. But in sports like the Tour de France, where potentially there's a course where there's no spectators, how much will it affect performance? Let's start off and ask you the question, first of all, on the soccer side. How much of an influence do you think playing in a spectatorless stadium will have on the result of patches? Oh, it has to have an effect because home, crowd support is one of the three or four reasons home ground advantage exists. So if we can start by saying like, is there such a thing or is it a, is it a myth? The answer is pretty clear that home ground advantage helps. So across all the sports that have stadia sport, uh, basketball, baseball, football, ice hockey, foot, soccer, rugby, the general stat is that something like between 55 and 65% of 
home matches are won by the oh, sorry of matches are won by the home team. So you're almost twice as likely to win playing at home as away. Not not quite one one and a half to one point eight times. Yeah, I was going to say one and a half would be seventy five percent, wouldn't it? Uh, yeah, so like sixty to forty. <laughs> so so sixty forty okay. gives you a one and a half times higher chance, right? So we so we um, know for a fact. So is that is that what you're saying? There's a good, there's a stat that confirms that yeah. the win ratio for the home team is distinctly higher than the, for the visiting team. Yes, and it's as I say, it's like in some in some it's in the low fifties. For other sports, it's up to the sixty five percent mark. In Super Rugby, for instance, it's sixty one percent overall. But what's really interesting is that. Because those of you listening who don't know this, Super Rugby is a tournament played across South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, and Argentina. So you play home matches against teams from your own country, internal, and against teams from other countries. When it's teams from other countries, the win percentage is upward of like 70, 80%. So what does that tell you? That tells you that the further you have to travel, the greater the home ground advantage is. Because there's a travel component to home ground advantage, travel fatigue, yeah. unfamiliarity, and all these sorts of things. Jet so, lag. so that <laughs> in the case of Super yeah. Rugby, jet lag. I mean, that doesn't happen in in Super Rugby is unique in that way because every second week you have a jet lag challenge over and above the normal challenges of travel. So, yeah. you know, in America, you travel from Los Angeles to New York. You have what's it, three hours of time zones and a six-hour six flight. Super Rugby, you're talking a 15-hour travel and eight. 10, 11 time zones, huge, huge challenge. Um, so travel is a component of, of home ground advantage. But the one that I think produces some really nifty stuff is home, home crowds and what they do. So for instance, they do a study in English football where they have a referee watch videos of foul play offenses. And when they watch it with the sound on, their decisions are significantly different compared to when the sound is off. So the sound made by the crowd, either cheering for or against the home team, influences the decision of the referee. When he's watching on video, I mean, why? who cares? It's a video. <laughs> but even then, there's a subconscious driver which ends up creating a scenario, and this has been shown, where home teams concede fewer free kicks and penalties, and the visiting teams get more yellow cards than home teams do. So referees, and, and this, is, this is true in football, it's true in ice hockey and basketball, and it's also true in rugby. Visiting teams are more harshly penalized by the referee. And a part of that is that when, when the crowd sees something happen on the field that they're unhappy with, they whistle and cheer and boo, and the referee responds to that by actually leaning one way, by a little bit more. So a 50-50 decision becomes a 60-40 <laughs> decision. Another one that's really interesting is, we know that home countries that host Olympic Games win more medals. Now, there's lots of reasons for that. They invest money. They, they come out there to win on, at home. It's their party. They don't want to be upstaged in their own, at their own wedding, basically. But what's really interesting is that that effect is disproportionately large in the subjectively scored events. So gymnastics, diving, whenever there's a subjective assessment, home teams, home athletes benefit more there than in other sports. And again, it's because that judge, for all his intentions to be neutral, is swayed by the response that the crowd has to the athlete. And that's a big factor. So uh, other examples are that when teams have been forced to play in empty stadiums in the past because of crowd troubles, whatever it is, their home ground advantage seems to be diminished. So there's no doubt that for as long as it takes to get us back to the normal situation in sport, home advantage is going to matter less than before. Not, not, not at all, because there are other elements to it, but less than before. I mean, I guess if you can have a virtual game where if you were watching this on television and, and you were able to have your speaker on, you could pipe all the cheers through to the stadium speakers <laughs> from, yeah. from all the fans watching it. I mean, it wouldn't be as good as having uh, the people live there, but it, I, I, I thought that was a fairly innocuous question, but I, the fact that you've actually got some research to suggest that, that, that there is a real quantifiable way of measuring crowd support. I mean, do you, would it apply to something like cycling? I, I, I mean, I was having this debate with a cycling mate of mine the other day saying that he thinks that the, they'll climb up the mountains better now because the crowds won't be getting in the way. And I said, well, yeah, but I do think that they'll, that will be offset by the fact that there's nobody encouraging them going up the mountains. So 
there's yeah, that it's a, it's an interesting one. J- just on the home crowd for team sports, quickly, the, the yellow cards, visiting teams get more yellow and red cards, concede more penalties. It could also be that the, the, the players, when they are visiting, actually do commit more fouls, and the referee is honestly assessing that. Because they're the away team, they get a little bit of the old sort of small man syndrome. They come out there with a point to prove away. I, it, there's lots going on there. The point, though, that I wanted to make is that there's, there's no doubt that athletes respond to crowds. Yeah. Um, when I was on the sevens circuit with the South African sevens team, we used to play in Scotland every year, in Murrayfield. And they didn't used to fall that. I mean, it's a 50-odd thousand, I, I forget. But it's a, they used to get three, two-thirds of it full. And before the Scots played, they'd have a bagpipe and they'd get fully behind it. I mean, this was spine-tingling stuff. And I knew when we, when we played Scotland at Murrayfield, it was a big problem. It, that, was a, that was one of the hardest matches we could play. When we played them everywhere else, it's still a challenge, but the players weren't psyched by it because, you know, it's, it's Scotland. At home, it's like <laughs> playing 50,000 people. So that, that clearly, players are not immune to that, is the point I'm trying to make. So similarly, when yeah. you put a, a guy on a bicycle and he's being yelled at on the way up Alpe d'Huez, he, he has to respond to that because yeah. there's a moment where his physiology says, I'm finished, I'm empty, I'm stopping. But the crowd support is an incentive to go on a little bit. There's some studies, for instance, that show you that in a laboratory, when you play in crowd cheering, athletes find a little bit extra. They find another 1% to 5%. They're not elite athletes who are highly self-motivated. So I don't know that Elliot Kipchoge is as susceptible to a cheering crowd as you or I. It makes a huge difference <laughs> to me, right? Because <laughs> I get to be it a does. hero for five seconds. I've never, I've never had it. <laughs> Those guys, yeah, I mean, like, I remember riding up to us and pretending that they were cheering for me. And it is, it is motivating. Yeah, I, don't think, I don't think that the front of the race is affected by it as much as the, the next quarter of the race, you know, the first quarter. Um, because those are the guys who are riding at 98%. Now they'll be 98, 99. Whereas the front of the race, I, it's hard to imagine that those guys have another gear. Then again, you think back at some guys, I mean, like you think the personality types of a Pantani, a Contador, you know, maybe yeah. those guys used to feed off it and actually use it. So there's no doubt. LeBron James, for, for interest's sake, um, before the lockdown and all happened, he said that he wouldn't play in an empty stadium. He said, <laughs> not a chance. He subsequently walked that back, I think, under, under some pressure. But the <laughs> players, you see, if they don't want it, then he tells you that it means something to them when it's there. I mean, is it, for you as a sports scientist, I mean, I guess it's a big job to do because there's all sorts of uh, things you can't determine, but would you, be, would you look at the, the climbs in a spectatorless Tour de France potentially and say, okay, we can say that, that, that if you don't have spectators, that there is a quantifiable measure of performance. Is that something that you'd be interested to, to actually look at as a sports scientist or is it yeah, an insignificant study? No, it would be very cool. If you had a, imagine you had a climb that was, let's say, 10 kilometers long and constant at 8%, uh, like a typical sort of challenging Pyrenean mountain finish or something in the Alps. If you, if you could have it, that like imagine every kilometer there was a batch of crowds and then nothing and then crowds and then nothing. I'm pretty sure you would see an oscillation in power output as they went up it. Yeah. Um, they yes. would respond to that. I think in the real world, because you don't get 10 kilometers constant 8%, you'll get a stretch at 5% and then it picks up to 10, 11%. Like they're going to attack based on that, not the crowds. So I think, I think in theory it exists as a factor, but I think in reality it probably gets lost a little bit, you know? Yeah, well, that's certainly a, a, a very interesting um, study that I would love to see and, and the absolute impact of, of cheering and also the kind of, like, I always think the best uh, example of how cheering actually helps is anybody who's ever done a VO2 max test. Mm. And I know that the protocol at the end of a VO2 max test, and for any of you that have done that, I'm sure lots of people listening have, you go as hard as you can until you blow. You go till you blow. But right at the end of the test, when you're actually absolutely at your limit, I think the protocol from the sports scientist, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ross, is that you, the, the, the sports scientist, whoever's doing the test, will encourage you to go harder. They'll be shouting at you saying, mm. go, go, go. Um, is that because there's empirical evidence that that does help push that person that 1% more? Yeah, I don't know about empirical evidence, but 
but certainly like experience um, and the, the prevailing wisdom is that the person, because physiologically we know that at the point that you want to give up, you're not yet maximized. We've spoken before about this idea that we fail doing exercise with a reserve. So at that moment when you're saying, actually, I'm, I can't turn these pedals, if you tell the guy, just give me 10 more pedal pushes, he can almost always get it. So how could you allow him to stop when he had 10 more, that's not a max test anymore. So, so you do encourage them. I have seen people actually have protocols where they provide no feedback because the problem then is that if the research is providing feedback and encouragement, they could in theory bias the results by changing how much they provide. <laughs> because if I, if I know that you're doing your VO2 max test after, I don't know, taking a sugar tablet as opposed to whatever drug I'm testing, then I could just moderate how much I encourage you to change the outcome. So it clearly makes a difference. It clearly, clearly makes a difference to performance. And that's also why a lot of elite athletes, and some of them may listen to this, they'll tell you that you can't use laboratory test results to predict real world performance. I think you can, but there's a lot of, there are a lot of guys who will exceed or outperform their own lab data. And why is that? It's because they're competitive animals, and when you put them in a race situation, they find something they can't access in a lab. And part of that, I'm not saying it's the only thing. I mean, part of it is the, is the $100,000 check that they'll get on the finish line. <laughs> but, but a big part of it is the fact that sports people are entertainers. They, they don't want to go out there and, and perform as if it's a warm-up or a practice match. They want the big show. Yeah, I mean, I, I, as I said, to you, I get so excited to talk about the, the, the idea of the principle of how far you can go in a race situation as opposed to a training one. And I, I think it's something we must look at ahead for, for another podcast because, but, you know, we talked, we talked a little bit about heart rate monitor training, about how people train with heart rate monitors, mm -hmm. but then they don't, using them in a, in, a, in a real world race situation, and the same applies to power meters, et cetera, et cetera, mm. is that a lot of the top cyclists say they never look at those numbers in a race situation, because if they do, they don't perform as well. So there's something yeah. very particular about how you perform in, in the, with the right incentive and what makes that happen. So it is a fascinating yeah. space. Yeah, there was a study actually, a Japanese study many years ago now, we're talking 20 years, maybe more, where they would put guys on a dynamometer. So this is just think about a in your gym, the leg extension machine, right? Where you can go and you can do leg extensions for the knee, knee extensions rather. And they make them do like what's called an MVC, a maximum voluntary contraction for like as long as they can till fatigue. So you're basically pushing out statically as hard as you possibly can. And then at the moment that these uh, participants started to drop off, they would have people cheering behind them. So they didn't see them, but they'd suddenly get all this crowd support. Come on, come on. And sure enough, it goes back up again. And then it comes back down because physiology starts winning the day, which always happens. And then right at the very last moment, they fired a gun behind these guys without telling them. And then you see the power goes right up again. So the point is that there's always, there's always, a, there's always a reserve. And the, the crowd, if you're receptive to it as an athlete, must contribute to that reserve. Yeah, I know. That's absolutely fascinating. I mean, we, we must definitely um, do something on that. But I think the message is that if you are a spectator and how long it will be before you can get into a stadium and support your favorite team, uh, we don't know. But it does make a difference. And I'm sure most of you that uh, are spectators of uh, big team sports will, uh, definitely love the experience of being there. But it, it shows you how important it is um, for people to be out there supporting their team. And uh, I think the, uh, the funny thing is, is I'm not sure that's, that professional sports people will necessarily admit how much they love the fact that spectators are out there um, because they often see them as annoyances, but actually they wouldn't perform as well if it wasn't for them. Yeah. I mean, any, I've asked a couple of athletes and they say, no, they block the crowd out and so on. But uh, I don't <laughs> know. I think, that, I think they yeah. say that because it's almost expected of them to do that. But when you look at guys when they score a try and they, or a goal and they run over to the crowd, I mean, they know, they know who's where in the crowd. They know where their fans are. It, it's, it's a mutual relationship that athletes have with their spectators. It has to be. It's one of the, it's one of the best things about sport. I saw, incidentally, um, that the Spanish were talking about doing things to try and liven up the grounds, because otherwise you get this hollow, empty. It sounds like they're playing in the bottom of a deep well. And I saw also in South Korea, they put pictures of spectators on the seats to try and make it look like <laughs> there were people there. At some point, you've got to think, actually, 
you're actually drawing attention to the issue here, not solving it. But uh, yeah, it'll be it'll be fun to see if anyone's able to get. Imagine you need six DJs playing crowd noises and music and that sort of stuff that fits the flow of the game. And uh, yeah, it's all it's all new territory. This. So. Yeah. Mm. Professor Rostock, I thank you very much again for your time today. Um, th there has been some questions. I think we've answered most of those questions on our patron site. Ross, are there any other ones we need to answer today from our uh, patrons? Yeah, so we, we covered one that Graham Smith had asked um, about community game, which I think is a big challenge. Uh, heard about rugby. He also asked about rugby returning with altered rules. At this stage, I don't know if that's going to happen. Uh, for rugby or any other sport, uh, certainly I know that we we've looked at in rugby where the contact happens, where's the highest risk of transmission if a player had it, uh, and can anything be done? But uh, perhaps by the time this podcast comes out, we'll know the answer to that. I don't know it now. And then he also spoke about as a trail runner, it would seem that niche sports like trail running are well suited to social distancing, which is true. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, certainly London Marathon is on the other end of the extreme. But but it might well be that things like that open up first. And then we also just had, similarly from William Valkyoja, I'm sorry, I've missed your cinema. Send me the phonetic spelling of that. On whether the, the, the outcome of sports might be changed as a result. Because basically what it says here is in football, Dortmund and Bayern München will still be on top. But in sports like running and cycling, the very different than normal build-ups into competition may yield different results than normal. Will there be more upsets in the spring classics or the grand tours? Will we see an unknown name win Boston or Berlin? How big a difference does the preparation effect or regular competition actually make? So it's an interesting one. I don't know. Um, I suspect that the status is so entrenched that the people who normally do well in sport will do better as a consequence of COVID because anything that disrupts the environment tends to disrupt places that it's less stable as a, as a rule. That makes sense. I think Yeah. But a place like Kenya that produces the runners or a place like Spain or France and Italy where, where many of the elite cyclists will base themselves are probably going to be less affected than places that are niche. And so I suspect that it actually might extend out the gap between between the haves and the have-nots because the haves can handle the disruption, whereas the have-nots find it more difficult. So I don't think I, I do worry about whether we'll see unknown athletes emerging because for four to six months there's been very little doping control, there's been very little integration of normal life and competition that would normally affect those things. So it's quite possible that some unknown athlete emerges out of lockdown because of some nefarious methods, but I don't think <laughs> it will be related to, to preparation. So, yeah, so those are the questions we got from William and from, from Graham. Um, good ones. Thanks for that. It gave us some good content. And as I said, we're going to ask our patrons again in preparation for our next podcast to share their content and questions so that we can address them. Yeah, don't forget you can interact with us on Twitter. We are Sports SciPod is our Twitter handle for this podcast. But uh, Science of Sport is Ross's uh, uh, Twitter handle, and he has many interesting discussions on his Twitter feed. I'm on Mike Finch SA, and uh, don't forget to share us share your stories about uh, how sport is maybe finding some traction in your communities. If you're seeing some unique things that are happening, and uh, you want to share those with us, um, we could obviously share them on the pod as well. And I think. They would be of great interest to our community of people who are very um, involved and entrenched um, in the sport itself and I think are looking for ways to get back into the game um, as safely as possible. Ross, thank you much for your time again today. F final word from you. Uh, I'd say ho have hope that there's light at the end of the tunnel. You know, like I don't want to jinx it by speaking too soon, but much of Europe is now in the very mature phase. They've released many of the lockdown elements. And because they're so cautious, because they're so attentive, they're able to pick up little mini outbreaks that might happen. And so far, it doesn't appear that the release has caused a return to that spike. So provided we move cautiously, I'm quite optimistic about where this all goes from a societal point of view and therefore from a sports point of view. And I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll actually have sport to talk, to talk about again within the next two to three months and that we'll have fans again by the end of the year. 
Um, I've, I'm going to cut it off with you finishing off there because I think it's quite nice for you to end it off sometimes. Just go straight in there. Cool. Perfect. No